she's, uh, she's honest at least, right? Um, well, next weekend, next weekend we're going to start uh, a three-week series on where we believe God is calling us uh, as a church. And so I, I want to invite you, and I would just ask if, you, if you'd make a priority uh, for these next three weeks just to be here, to listen. Pastor Jeremy is sort of going to uh, unwrap what, what he believes God has laid on our, his heart for us as a church and where we believe that we're going. It's not, not just who we are, but really who we aspire to be. And that's what we're going to do for the next three weeks. So hopefully you can join us uh, for that. Today, we're, we're concluding the series we've been in called Facing God, and what we've been doing in this series is, is each week trying to take a, a different aspect of God's character and look at that and, and see if we might be able to better understand who God really is, who He says that He is, and as a result of that, that we might be able to worship Him. And today, we're going to look and talk about His greatness, the greatness of God. And as I was thinking about that, it, it struck me that this sermon really, I think, is the culmination of, of everywhere we've been thus far. In many ways, it's the culmination of the series itself because his, his greatness is a result of all those things that we've been talking about, uh, his joy, his goodness, his power, his justice, his beauty, his presence, all, those things and, and thousands more things are what make God great. You know, greatness is something that our culture uh, celebrates. If you're a sports fan, you've likely been a part of, of some of these conversations, conversations about goats, right? The greatest of all time. We like to have these conversations, who's, who's the greatest of all time in these various sports, and we call them goats. Um, I did some research this week, and I, I looked at a lot of these surveys online, and it's interesting. In some sports, it's, it's very clear. There is no debate. In other sports, there are, you know, there are some debates about that. For instance, if you go, if you go to boxing, it, it, there really was, was no debate. Um, Muhammad Ali was the greatest of all time. Um, not just because he said that he was. I mean, people actually agreed. People actually voted and said they think he's the greatest boxer uh, of all time. If you, look at, if you look at soccer or a football, as the rest of the world calls it, uh, a Pele, the greatest player of all time. Uh, he, he's, he's, he holds the, record for, the scoring record for the Brazilian national team, which is, which is historically the, one of the strongest soccer teams in all the world. He actually holds the Guinness record for the most goals scored. Now, if you know anything about soccer, uh, and I don't, uh, but even I can appreciate this statistic. Listen to this statistic. This is the Guinness Book of World Records. He scored 1,283 goals in 1,363 games. He, he scored a goal in 95% of the games that he played in. I mean, most teams can't even say that. Pele could say that. He's the greatest of all time. Now, when you get to basketball, there, there's a little more controversy. The arguments heat up a bit, and if you're a sports fan, you would know this. Some people, some people would argue that, that Bill Russell is the greatest basketball player of all time, mainly because he won 11 NBA championships. He has 11 rings. Other people would say Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, he, he scored more points than anyone in the history of the league. But, but the consensus, if you look at all the, the surveys, the consensus is still Michael Jordan. The greatest basketball player of all time. He, he, he played in six NBA finals. He won six NBA championships. He was the MVP of the series six times. It's perfection. He's the greatest basketball player of all time. Now, if LeBron continues, that, that debate is going to continue. People will question that. But, but Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time. Now, if you've, if you've been a part of some of these debates, uh, discussions, sometimes they can get a little heated. Because sports fans are serious. When they, when they throw out the word the greatest of all time, they are serious about that. Now, some of the rest of us, uh, we, we use that word a little more carelessly. We talk about our pizza being great, right? We talk about the movie being great. Tony the Tiger said about Frosted Flakes, what did he say? They're great, right? We're sort of casual when we use this word. And so if you combine that with the fact that we're, we're trying today to talk about the greatness of the God of the universe, this is a little daunting this morning. Psalm 145.3 says this, says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. His greatness is unsearchable. So in some sense, we're already in a losing battle here, right? I mean, we won't even be able to comprehend this. But I think it's compounded again by the fact that, that some of us, if we've grown up in church, if we've been around the church, we, we're pretty familiar with God. 
We think we, we know a lot of things about him. And you see, unfortunately, our familiarity with God often sometimes causes us to cease to be impressed with God as well. And yet the truth is, what we have experienced, what we think we know about God is, is so small. It's so small. Job says in chapter 26, he spends this entire chapter talking about the greatness of God. He talks about his power and his majesty and, and all the things that he has done. And then in verse 14, he says this, Behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways. How small a whisper do we hear of him? But the thunder of his power, who can understand? You see, what we see, what we, what we know about God is just a whisper. It, it's just a, a, a minute part of that. I mean, think for a minute. Think about the last time that, that something just took your breath away. I mean, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you went out west, you stood in the Rocky Mountains and you just saw this and, and, and it took your breath away. Maybe you, maybe you went to the ocean and you, you see the waves crashing on the beach and it took your breath away. Maybe, maybe a, a sunset here this fall, we've had some beautiful sunsets. Maybe, maybe you've seen a, a newborn baby and it just took your breath away. Those are, those are just the outskirts of His greatness. Those, those are just whispers of God's greatness to us. So today, as we, as we try and see His greatness, I hope you understand the challenge that's before us. Frankly, I'm, I'm overwhelmed when I think about it. So let's just pray. Let's pause and just ask God to do something that, that only He can do. Father, as the psalmist said, Your greatness is unsearchable, so there is no way we, we can begin to understand it. There's no way we can begin to comprehend it. But Lord, forgive us. Take away whatever familiarity we might have, anything that would keep us really from seeing you as you are. And I pray this morning, God, that you might just give us a glimpse. Give us just another whisper of your greatness. And as a result of that, would you, would you stir our hearts to worship as a result of that? Lord, we're incapable of, of seeing you on our own. We need you to reveal yourself to us. So I pray by the power of your spirit that you would do that in our hearts. Open our eyes to see you this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our passage today in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is writing to a people and they are, they are uh, they're in captivity. Um, they're, they're suffering. They're, they're beginning to doubt what's, what's happening to them. And the message Isaiah has for them uh, is to look up. At the end of verse 9, he says, Behold your God, the, the God of your fathers, the God who has always been there for you. He says, Behold your God. You see, like, like many of us, um, the people that Isaiah is writing to, they, they know this, but they've just they've forgotten this. You see, in the midst of, of the struggle, in the midst of their, their suffering, it's easy for us to forget and so twice in this passage, Isaiah says, do you not know? Do you not hear? He says that in verse 21. And then again in verse 28, he says, have you not heard? Have you not known? You see, they had known, and they, they do know. They'd just forgotten. And so what Isaiah is doing here in this passage is he's simply trying to remind them. And his exhortation to them is to, is to look up. It's to look up and to behold their God. So that's my prayer for us as we open his word here, as we, as we talk this morning, that we might be able to, to behold God. And we're going to do something a little different uh, this morning. I thought, I mean, there are hundreds of verses. We could scour the Bible. We could read hundreds of passages that talk about God's grace, God's greatness. But we're going to focus most of our time just on one single verse in this passage and I want to look at it, and I want, to, I want to try and understand the implications of that and see if that might help us see His greatness. Um, there's an acquaintance of mine. He, he wrote a book about the beauty of God, and in that, that book, he spent an entire chapter talking about the glory of God that we see in the universe, which Isaiah talks about here in, in verse 26. And so I'm going to lean on, on, on him a lot as in this part of the sermon here. But I think it's fitting. So look at, let's look at verse 26. And we're going to camp here for a little bit this morning. He says, lift, up, lift your eyes on high and see. 
Who created these? He brings out their host by number, calling them all by name. By the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Now, Isaiah is calling them to look at the heavens, to look, to look up at the stars, and he's saying, God created all of them. Not one is missing, and God knows every one of their names. There's another verse in the Bible that says something similar. If you've been around church, you might have heard it in Psalm 19. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. So we're going we're gonna to spend a little time just talking about the heavens this morning. This is not a science class, but, but I think there's a sense in which God actually, he, he wants us to sort of be amateur astronomers. He wants us to actually look up and, and see if we might see his greatness in the midst of that. So, so as we do a little science work this morning, my hope before we're done is that it might translate into some theology as well. See, part of the problem is I think when, when we say something like, well, well God is infinite, That becomes sort of meaningless because all we mean by that usually is just that it's beyond our human ability. That's really all we're saying. You see, our thinking is so limited that that we risk reducing God's greatness to, to our standards, to the things that we can get our minds around, the things that we can comprehend. When we say that God is limitless in power and that He is present throughout the universe, that is theologically true. I'm just not sure it's that helpful for us because we don't comprehend it. You see, though, that's that's where I think science might be able to help us a little bit. Sometimes we need measurements. Sometimes we need models to to get our minds around things. So we're going to try some experiments here. How many of you have flown in an airplane before? How many? Most of you have flown in an airplane. A commercial airplane today typically flies about 500 miles an hour, okay? Okay. About 500 miles an hour. So keep that in mind. That's going to be the speed as we, as we take a little trip here this morning, okay? Keep that in mind. 500 miles an hour. That's a little faster than you drive, hopefully. But, but, but relative to other things, it's actually pretty slow. Some of you may remember from your science class way back when, but, but the speed of light. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. That's how fast light travels. And in case you're wondering, that's about 670 million miles per hour. So let that sink in for just a second. And what what that means is that that light could travel around the earth seven times in one second. That's the speed of light. And if you you multiply that 186,000 miles per second times 60, you would get a light minute. How far light would travel in a minute, right? Right? And if you multiply that by 60 again, you would get a light hour. How far light would travel in an hour? And then you multiply that by 24. How far light would travel in a day? That's a light day. And then if you multiply that by by 365, you would get how far light would travel in a year, a light year. Who had their calculator out? Anyone? Six trillion miles. That's how far light can travel in one year. And just to, to give you some perspective, that would be, that'd be about 12 million round trips to the moon. That's how far light can travel in a year. We're not going to go that fast. We're going 500 miles an hour, okay? Let's go back to our example and let's go on a, a little trip. If we, if we wanted to just go to the moon, traveling 500 miles an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it would take us about three weeks to get there, okay? Okay? If you want to go a little farther, maybe you want to go to the, to the sun, 93 million miles away, it would, it would take you about 21 years to get there. If you wanted to visit Pluto, uh, the farthest out planet in the solar system, at least it used to be when I was in science, it got a demotion a couple years ago, I don't know if you heard that. It, it's not considered a planet anymore, it's like a dwarf planet now, uh, but still, let's, we know Pluto's out there, 900 years to get there. 500 miles an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 900 years. Maybe, maybe to give you some perspective, maybe this will be helpful. Imagine, uh, imagine this uh, is the earth, okay? If the earth was the size of this grapefruit, tracking with me so far? If the, if the earth was the size of this grapefruit, then the moon would be uh, the size of this ping pong ball about right here, okay? And 
gravity still in our solar system so far. If you wanted to visit the sun, it would be the size of a four-story building a mile, three miles away. And if you wanted to go all the way to Pluto, all the way out to Pluto, it would be the size uh, of a marble. You wouldn't even be able to see it 37 miles away. That's just some perspective on our solar system. This is just our solar system. And when you look up in the sky, you, you can see the stars, and they seem pretty close, right? You think, man, I would just love to go. How about, how about we just visit a star? Scientists tell us that the closest star is actually a group of three. It's called Alpha Centauri. It is 4.3 light years away from us. And so if you wanted to keep traveling past, past Pluto after those 900 years, you wanted to go just to the closest star, 500 miles an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you would get there in about six million years. Are you starting to get the picture here? Maybe just one more stop. We could keep going, but just one more maybe. Uh, in, in 1990, NASA sent the, the Hubble telescope into steps to space. And ever since then, it's been, it's been sending these amazing pictures back to NASA. And astronomers estimate that, that they have, the Hubble telescope has, has looked as far out into the universe as it can look. The, the farthest galaxy that we know of, that we can see, they estimate that it's 13 billion light years from Earth. Remember, a light year is six trillion miles. So you know what that means? This is how close that galaxy is to us. That, that's 78 with 21 zeros after it. That is 78 sextillion miles from Earth. And every scientist believes there's more beyond that. That's just what we know. So I hope your mind is beginning to expand a bit. So we're going to change gears, but we're going to keep is some science here. We're trying to get some perspective on the size of the universe, but, but what, what about all that's in it? What, what, what makes up our universe? Again, think about the stars. The sun we see, that's, that's just the star in our solar system, but our solar system is part of the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy, we're told, is 100,000 light years in diameter. From one end to the other, 100,000 light years, traveling at 186,000 miles per second. So how many stars do you think are in our galaxy? Well, I mean, just in the Milky Way galaxy, what would, you, what would you think? If you look up on a clear night, you could probably see somewhere between, if you could count them, you could see somewhere between four and 6,000 stars, okay? Again, scientists tell us that in the Milky Way galaxy, Somewhere between 150 and 200 billion stars. And the Milky Way galaxy is one galaxy of about 150 billion other ones. Maybe one way to think about it, I've, I've given this example before, but, but if, you, if you've been to the beach, if you've ever been to the beach and you just kind of, you scoop your hand down in the sand and you, you know, the water pulls some of the grains of sand down, but you, you've got a, a clump of sand in your hand. If, if you started counting the grains of sand in your hand, yeah, you'd probably go crazy before you got to the end, right? But, but if you could do that, and then you could keep counting, and you could count all the sand on that beach, and then you could count all the sand on every beach on the face of the earth, there's more stars in heaven than that. And Isaiah tells us that God made them all. Not only that, he, he named them all. Psalm 147, verses 4 and 5 says something different, something similar. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. That's an understatement. Maybe one more thing. One more bit of science here. I know some of you, some of you like to work out. You, you like to pump iron. You can lift a lot of weight. Corey likes to tell me how much weight he can lift. Some of you go to CrossFit. Some stars in the universe have 50 million times the mass of our Earth. 50 million times the mass. 
Now remember, there's 150 uh, billion galaxies with tens to hundreds of billions of stars. That's the weight in, this, in the heavens. Who, who's holding all that up? God is holding it up. He's not breaking a sweat. His, his muscles aren't cramping. He's, he's holding all this in place. One last example, one particular kind of star. It's called a neutron star. It's relatively small as stars go. It's only about 10 miles across, but they say it's the most dense star in the universe. So if your mind can still handle anything else, here we go. They say if you were to scoop just a teaspoonful of matter from a neutron star, a a teaspoonful of matter, that it would weigh 3 billion tons. That, that, that's six trillion pounds. And so, so if a word picture is helpful here, it would be the equivalent of stuffing 50 million elephants in a thimble. You see, if, if just that, that much of a neutron star, if I, if I dropped it right here, it, it would go like a bullet through cotton. It would go all the way through the earth and come out on the other side. And who made neutron stars? Who who holds these in place? Isaiah says, God does. So just let that sink in for a moment. See, because when we start to talk about the magnitude of the universe, um, I mean, even all these numbers, it's beyond our ability to understand and to comprehend. And yet everything I've said, if you could, if you could comprehend all those numbers, everything I've talked about, here's the reality. They'd be like a a microscopic speck on the tip of God's finger. That's the God that we worship. So I hope you didn't mind spending a little time on science. I think it's helpful for us just to to get a picture of who God is. And and I actually believe God gives us science. He he wants us to explore like this because it helps us to see Him as He is. Our worship is impacted. The more we know about the world around us, the more I think we will worship God. And so in light of all of this, Isaiah's question in verse 25 seems, uh, it seems relevant. Again, he's, he's writing to these people who are we're in captivity, they're, they're doubting, they have fears, and they ask questions, and, and they're being tempted to follow these false gods in Babylon. And, and so the question, verse 25, is, to whom then shall you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Again, they're seduced, they're, they're tempted to believe in other gods, and it, it seems foolish in light of this, right? And yet, as I was reading this, I was just convicted about myself. I mean, when, when we fail, when I fail to see the greatness of God, the, the things of this world become so attractive. It's so easy for me to want to chase after one of the gods of this world when I don't see the greatness of God. I mean, money and, and power and, and fame and sex, all these things allure us, they entice us because we don't see the greatness of God. We, we think we're going to find what we need, what, what we want in all these other things. And I think the reason is because we've just become numb to the greatness of God. But I'm convinced that as we, as we see His greatness, as we see the greatness of God, that, that we actually can be changed, that we will be changed. I'm convinced if we saw the greatness of God, we wouldn't worry near so much about our finances. If we could see the greatness of God, our eyes wouldn't stray after, as for lust, after lustful images and thoughts so, so quickly. If we saw the greatness of God, we wouldn't get angry with our children so easily. If we saw the greatness of God, we wouldn't get our feelings hurt so easily. If we saw the greatness of God, we, w- we wouldn't get so anxious watching the news and, and seeing all the brokenness in the world around us. And that's why Isaiah says, I think in verse 26, he, in verse 26, he says, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes, he says. The people are, are trapped in captivity. They're suffering. They're, they're wondering what's going to happen. All they can see is what, what they see around them, the things that are happening. 
And Isaiah says to them, and I, I think he says to us as well, he says, lift up your eyes. He says, behold your God. I mean, it sort of reminds me of the story in Matthew 14 when the disciples are in a boat, they're out on the lake, and the waves are, are beginning to crash in, and they're, they're getting nervous, and they, they look off in the distance, and, and Jesus is walking to them on the water. And they're not sure, and they finally realize it's Jesus, and Peter says, Jesus, if that's you, let me come out to you. And Jesus says, come on, Peter. And Peter, with his eyes fixed on Jesus, steps out of the boat and begins to walk on the water. But do you remember what the passage says? See, then he began to look at the waves. He began to see the things going on around him. He began to focus on his circumstances, and he began to sink. You see, what Isaiah is telling us here is, is take your eyes off your circumstances. Take, take your eyes off yourself. Take your eyes off your situation and look at who God is. See His greatness. Behold His greatness. His power, His goodness, His beauty, His, His presence, all those things. Behold your God. And it's not to say that your circumstances aren't important. They are. Rather, I think what he's saying is that your circumstances are in the hands of a God like this. He holds them. The God who governs the entire universe, that God holds it all. Verse 26 says, he created everything. I mean, there was a time when there was nothing, and then then God spoke, and everything came into being. The reason there's something instead of nothing is because of God. The reason that we are something instead of nothing is because of God. It also says that he brings out their host by number. God God set every one of those trillions and trillions of stars, he set them into place. They're like soldiers at attention. They are there at his command. He calls them by name. They're his. Not one of them is missing. And you begin to see why the psalmist would say that his his greatness is unsearchable. So as Isaiah goes on in verse 27, he says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. See, I think the people were asking the same questions that I am prone to ask. When things get difficult, when, 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 when I'm in, in the midst of suffering, when something's happening that, that I don't like, my questions are usually things like, God, where are you? God, God don't you see? Don't, don't, don't you care? God, God, can't you do anything about this? These people are asking the same questions. Listen to what Isaiah says in verse 28. Again, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Isaiah reminds them, he he created all things. He created all of those stars, those trillions and trillions of stars. He, He named them all. Colossians says that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He's holding it all up. And the crazy thing about it is, the passage says he never gets tired. He never gets weary. His energy is never diminished. There is infinitely more in the tank than what has already been exerted here. And this God, this God who has all power, is eager to share it with all who have need. Listen to verse 29. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. See, after all that God has done, after all this creating, after all of this sustaining, after all this energy has been expended, he still has a limitless supply to give to us. See, God has has never had to tell anyone... um, Oh, 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 sorry, you might have to wait a little bit. You know, I, I miscalculated. I probably should have stopped after 150 billion stars. I'm, I'm a little tired. Now, could you, could you give me a week? Come back in a week and maybe I could help you. God never has to say that. 
It says he gives strength. And the strength he's talking about is not, not necessarily physical strength. It's certainly not primarily physical strength. He's not going to turn you into the incredible Hulk. That's not what he's talking about. The strength that God gives is, is the willpower to keep going even in the midst of situations like this. And in fact, Isaiah, he contrasts God and all his power, all his might. He, he contrasts him with, with, at a worldly level, what might be the, most, the strongest among us. He talks about a young man. I mean, think about an athlete. Maybe it's a soldier. Again, maybe it's a cross phenomenon. I mean, think about the athletes we talked about at the beginning, right? Those people were at the prime of their life. They're, they're the greatest of all time, we just said, right? But guess what? Pele is 77 now. And Messi could probably embarrass him today. You see, that's what happens. Even the greatest of all time, we have our limits, but not God. He has no limits. And the power that he has, he's willing to share with us. Verse 31, a very popular verse says, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. See, God has no limits. And He's willing to to give strength to those who wait for Him. So how does He do that? How how does He strengthen us? I mean, certainly in, in one sense... He strengthens our inner being. Ephesians 3 talks about that. He strengthens us in our inner being. But I think there's something else in view that Isaiah is talking about here. He actually strengthens us as we wait. Because, see, there's there's strength in the waiting. I mean, you might might translate it better. Translate that word wait for, for hope. Because waiting, I think for us many times, we we think about that like it's a a passive activity. It's not a passive activity. I mean, kids know this. When they're they're sitting at the window waiting for mom or dad to come home, every car that pulls up, they're waiting, they're looking. Or maybe parents, uh, we're waiting for that text message from our kids, right? We we need to hear what's going on. How are they doing? We're waiting for the text message. It's not a passive activity. It's very active. It's also one of the most difficult things, I think, that we're called to do as Christians. It's to wait. And yet in the waiting, there's both anticipation and and expectation. We can have that. So as followers of Jesus, even even though we might be discouraged or or depressed, maybe even despondent, there, there is still this faint glimmer of hope because of who God is. There's hope in the waiting. And Christians, we... We can be, some days we're discouraged, some days we're, we're encouraged. Sometimes we're optimistic, sometimes we're pessimistic. Sometimes we're, we're sad, sometimes we're, we're scared. But there's always reason for hope. Because of who God is, we can endure almost anything with hope. Our, our faith may be there may just be so little of it, just a, a flicker. We're, we're like the man in Scripture who said, I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. Many times that's where we are. And sometimes we actually need people to come around us to, to remind us, yes, there is a God. Yes, He's good. He's, he's great. He sees. He knows. He's for you. He'll never leave you. Sometimes we need people to remind us of that. Isaiah was reminding them of that. Greatness of God is good news for weary people who wait for Him. And I don't know, I don't know where you are uh, this morning. Um, some of you came in here probably feeling really small, really weak, really weary. Maybe facing some things, some situations that, that you have no idea what to do next with. I think if we're honest, I I think all of our lives probably look a little different than we thought they were going to. I think if we're honest, all of us could say that. Some of you may be weary here this morning because you you thought religion was about doing things. And and so you've been trying, you've been been doing all these things and you're exhausted. 
Others of you may be weary today because you, you've bought into what culture says. And, and culture says just look inside, find, the, find your inner strength, look inside and, and get your strength there and you've tried that and it hasn't worked and you're weary. And Isaiah has a very different answer for us. He says, behold. He says, lift up your eyes and behold your God. Instead of saying, keep trying, keep doing, look inside, he doesn't say that. He say, actually, he says, don't look inside. Don't keep trying. Just look up and behold your God. The greatness of God is good news for weary people who wait for Him. And you're probably thinking, well, unpack that a little. Help me understand how does that work. Let's go back to the, the beginning, the first part of the passage that was read today. I'm going to start at the end of verse 9 and read verses 10 and 11. At the end of verse 9, he says, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might, and His arm rules for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him and His recompense before Him. He will tend His flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in His arms. He will carry them in His bosom and gently lead those that are with the young. So how does His greatness connect to our weakness? How does that happen? Listen, it's not by mockery. It's in mercy. His arm, His strong arm, the one that is full of might, is the same arm that, that actually will carry us. This strong one, this great one who is beyond compare is also our good shepherd. Isaiah says He will gather us. He will carry us. He will lead us. You see, this is what makes Christianity unique. It, it doesn't say come and and try harder and, and do more. Look, look within. That's not the message of Christianity. Instead, it says, look to me. And so if you're here today and you, you've been trying to do it yourself, you've been trying to clean up your own act, you've been looking inside for, for power, God says, stop looking there and just simply look to me. He says, I don't expect you to clean up your act first. I don't expect you to do this yourself. Frankly, I know that you can't. And that's why I sent Jesus. So look to Him. The invitation this morning, frankly, is for, for all of us. It's for, for everyone in this room. I mean, some of you have walked with Jesus most of your life. But maybe you've just forgotten. You've lost sight of His greatness. Some of you are here today, maybe everything I'm saying is, is new. The invitation is for you as well. Just look to Jesus. See, the greatness of God was manifested in the person of Jesus. The one who was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. The one who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The one who knew no sin but, but became sin on our behalf that we might be called the righteousness of God. The one who for the joy set before him endured the cross. The one who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but he emptied himself. He took the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Fix your eyes on Jesus the author and the perfecter of your faith. You see, when we, when we behold Him, when we lift our eyes, when we behold Him as He is face to face, the Bible says that we will be changed. Paul says from one degree of glory to another. That is a glorious promise. So wait on Him. Hope in Him. Worship Him. Church, Lift your eyes and behold your God. Let's pray.
Father, we, we want to behold you. We, we struggle to do it, though. Lord, our, we are tempted to look at the things around us. We are so easily uh, distracted and enticed by the things of this world. And Lord, the truth is we can't take much. We, uh, we would be overcome. We, your greatness is unsearchable. And, and what we see is just a whisper of that. But thank you for giving us whispers. Would you give us more of those? Would you whisper in our ear? Would you open our eyes just to see glimpses of your greatness? And Lord, I pray as a result of that, that we would be changed. Lord, that we would be people that look more and more like Jesus. And Lord, I pray as a result of that, that not, not so that we would get any attention at all, but so that the world would see you and how great and awesome and mighty you are. So Lord, would you give us a vision of your greatness? Would you allow our hearts to worship you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.